Good morning, everybody. Uh, apologies for the slight delay in starting, but now we're ready to uh, begin this uh, online information session dealing with the call for evidence on possible on a possible restriction of lead in gunshot, in bullets, and in fishing sinkers. The structure of this WebEx today will be uh, about 30 minutes of presentation from us to introduce the subject, and then about an hour of questions and answers. So let's get on with the uh, uh, the presentations. So we're with you today. We have myself. I'm leading one of the teams here in ECHA dealing with risk management and uh, specifically responsible for restrictions. And we have my colleague, colleagues Ida Letimaki, uh, who is uh, one of our scientific officers working here on the project. Uh, we have Christian Lochtmeyer, who is uh, a socioeconomic analysis anal analyst, who is uh, also the project leader for this uh, investigation. And last but not least, we have Peter Simpson, who is the restriction process coordinator uh, for uh, in ECHA. So just to run through some of the administration uh, for this uh, in online information session. So to ask a question, you need to use the Q&A panel uh, that uh, is uh, included in the in the Webex. Uh, we uh, how will answer as many of the questions that are put to us uh, today as we can in the 60 minutes we have. Uh, the remaining questions we will answer afterwards, and this will be done in the uh, Q&A document that we will publish as soon as possible after the event. So if we don't get around to your question today, uh, it will be taken into account and answered in the uh, Q&A document that we will publish. If you have questions that uh, occur to you after the event, you can make use of the normal contact form, but we won't necessarily be able to include them uh, in the Q&A document. All press inquiries as normal need to come to our press office functional mailbox and you can see the uh, the email address on the screen. Just to let you know, we will also be recording this uh, online information session uh, and the recording and the presentations will be published on our website uh, along with the question and answer document. Uh, and we have uh, recently uh, also published a hot topics page for this uh, particular project and uh, there will be links uh, to these uh, documents also from uh, from this uh, Hot Topics page. So today's objective is to a little bit introduce the uh, REACH uh, restriction procedure for those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, to give a little bit of a reminder about the previous restriction proposal uh, that we investigated and proposed a restriction for, and this was the use of lead gunshot in wetlands. We'll also then outline the scope of our following investigation that the Commission also asked us to do, uh, and this was into the use of lead in shooting and fishing, uh, and uh, which eventually might result in, in a further restriction proposal once we take into account also the information uh, gathered today and uh, in, other, in other ways. Uh, the, also, the today's objective is also to try to help you to decide if and what information that you should submit in the call for evidence, to clarify the elements of the information that we'll be requesting. But just to say this will not be a debate about the need for a restriction. We are purely here to, uh, uh, to help you to uh, respond to the, the call for evidence, so then we can consider all this information during our investigation. So first, a introduction to the uh, REACH restriction process. So a restriction under REACH can be any condition on the manufacture, import or use of a substance. And this can be a substance on its own, in a mixture or in an article. And it provides uh, also a safety net uh, for other uh, types of uh, risk management where a substance cannot be uh, controlled or, or cannot be uh, restricted under that particular piece of uh, legislation and REACH can often provide a safety net. Restrictions are used to address a risk that's not adequately controlled and we'll come back to that later and also when an action is needed at the union level and again this is something we will come back to in a, in a little while. Uh, the ECHA uh, investigate the need for a restriction only on request from the European Commission and we have 12 months 
to make this investigation. Uh, and the investigation may conclude, uh, of course, that the restriction is needed, but it also might conclude there is no need for restriction because the risks are controlled, or there is no need for action at the union level. Or it could be that the restriction has a different scope from the, uh, uh, the request uh, from the Commission. So the first stage in the process is to make the registry of intentions for the investigation and this has uh, been done uh, last week and as you can see the, um, uh, the ROI entry for this uh, investigation is, is already online and you can see it on the screen in front of you. So it's to look at the uh, placing on the market and use of LENAP ammunition and fishing tackle. To have a restriction, we need to, to make uh, a number of considerations during our investigation, uh, and they are for the risk and the impact of any action that is taken. So the risk uh, is uh, a risk assessment uh, conducted according to a particular annex in REACH, which sets out the uh, way that risk assessments should be done. And uh, we have several approaches possible for the risk. First of all, uh, for types of substances with a threshold, uh, we can undertake uh, a particular type of assessment which looks at the hazard of the substance. So what are the intrinsic uh, properties? Uh, what is the exposure to this, the assessment? And then looking at whether uh, the exposure uh, is above the, uh, the limit that we have uh, uh, assessed in the, the hazard part of the, um, the uh, uh, evaluation and then we say whether or not there's a, the risk. And this is what we call the risk characterization ratio. And if this is above one, we say that the risk is not adequately controlled. And this is the case for lead when we're talking about uh, uh, exposure to the environment. For substance, there are also substances with no safe uh, exposure or threshold uh, and these we call non-threshold substances uh, and here we use more of a uh, semi-quantitative or qualitative approach to the uh, to the risk assessment and examples of these are PBT and VPVB substances that's uh, persistent bioaccumulative or toxic substances or very persistent very bioaccumulative substances and also non-threshold carcinogens and other uh, substances. And this is actually the case for lead when we're looking at human health effects. There, there are several uh, effects, including its effects on uh, development, neurotoxic neuro, uh, development in neuro, uh, neurological development uh, in children, and also several other effects. Uh, and then, if the other uh, mechanisms are impractical, we can take a more case by case basis for the risk assessment. In terms of impact, we look at the effectiveness of a proposed restriction. Uh, and there are several key criteria for justifying that. Uh, the restriction, for example, must be targeted uh, to uh, whatever effects and exposures have been uh, assessed during the risk assessment. Uh, and then it also must be capable of reducing those risks within a reasonable time period. We also look at the socioeconomic uh, parts of the uh, impact, uh, carrying out a, a quite detailed analysis, and we look at what are the benefits uh, to human health and the environment, and what are the costs to the various uh, parties involved, often manufacturers, importers, or consumers. The restriction proposal, if we find this is uh, the way to go forward, uh, and the timelines uh, are as follows. So we, we would submit the uh, restriction uh, for evaluation in our scientific committees in what we call the Annex 15 format. And this sets out what the problem is with the substance, mainly dealing with the risk and several other issues, what the impact of any measure that's taken is, including the socioeconomic analysis, then what uncertainties and, uh, uncertainties and assumptions there are in the uh, assessments that we've made, and then finally the conclusion. We try to make the Annex 15 report publicly available as soon as we can after submission, normally two to three weeks. 
and then the opinion making process starts and this takes about 12 months in our scientific committees. The first stage is a conformity check so the committees each uh, look at uh, whether or not the uh, proposal contains all of the relevant information under the uh, particular headings and then the two committees the risk assessment committee RAC and the socio-economic uh, assessment committee or SEAC then undertake an evaluation of the proposal. And this results in an opinion on the uh, proposal and these are then sent to the Commission for a decision. So first, before we move on to the new work, we thought it would be useful just to quickly recap our previous proposal on the use of lead gunshots in wetlands. So this was the result of a previous request from the Commission where we investigated the need for action and decided there was the need and uh, made a, a proposal that was submitted to our committees. The request from, from the Commission was to uh, look at uh, the uh, several elements including uh, the, uh, how the harmonisation of the implementation of a particular international agreement, the African-Eurasian Water Birds Agreement, had been implemented. Uh, and this was because the EU itself is a, a party to this um, uh, international agreement and it's also, many member states are, are also uh, parties. And uh, the agreement has been implemented in, in many different ways in, in different member states and in addition four member states had not implemented any measures. So we added the intention for this restriction investigation in the ROI in uh, April 2016 and we submitted a report in April 2017 after our investigation which we evaluated there was a need for a restriction. Uh, so uh, the reason we thought a restriction was needed was because we concluded uh, that the uh, uh, use of lead gunshot in wetlands posed a risk that was not adequately controlled. We uh, evaluated that there was uh, deaths of up to uh, 1 million water birds per year due to uh, the acute uh, lead poisoning and also there were many more uh, poisonings of other animals scavenging and predatory birds for example that were occurring because of the uh, lead shot being uh, scattered into wetlands. The proposal was evaluated by RAC and SEAC. They agreed that uh, there was uh, a risk that was not adequately controlled uh, and SEAC concluded that the benefits of the restriction would outweigh the costs and the cost to hunters seem uh, affordable. Uh, during that time we also had the public consultation uh, and these, this information was taken into account during the RAC and SEAC discussions. And finally the opinions were adopted in June 2018. Uh, the opinions were sent to the Commission but uh, the final uh, work has not been concluded in uh, the Commission and with the Member States uh, and so no decision has yet been made whether or not the restriction uh, will is uh, justified. So here we also just want to make clear that the wetlands is not the focus of the current investigation. This is something that we will take into account in our in investigation as uh, the, the baseline of, of, of uh, the use of uh, the lead shots in particular. So now I will hand over to Christian who will take you through the next uh, part of the presentation. Thank you Christian. Yes, thank you. Thank you Mark, good morning to everybody. So I will talk you through the scope of our investigation into the uses of lead in shooting and in fishing. We are investigating the few, these uses because alongside the preparation of the wetlands proposal uh, we undertook a parallel study on the risks posed by other uses of lead. That was asked to us by the Commission in the request um, that was also in which we were also requested to look into the wetlands. This resulted in a study that was published in 2018 that was a study of a review of the avail available material. A study concluded that there was sufficient evidence of risk to justify additional risk management of the use of lead gunshots in, in non-wetland areas, the use of lead bullets, and the use of leads in fishing tackle. 
a conclusion was supported by the fact that several member states have taken measures to prohibit the use of lead in gunshot outside of wetlands and also in fishing tackle. And we had found evidence that the use of lead containing bullets is also prohibited in some regions in the EU. On the basis of that report, the Commission requested ECHA to develop an Annex 15 restriction report on these uses, and that request was done in July 2019. We published it in August, and it went on to the ROI, as Mark said, uh, in October. So that means that by the 10th of October 2020, it is our expected submission date. We found that in the EU, we are now working on the use of shot in or over wetlands. In the Netherlands, there's a use of lead shot in hunting and in sport shooting is prohibited. In Denmark, there's a total prohibition of the use of lead shot in hunting. In the UK, the use of lead fishing sinkers, depending on the size. In Germany, different legislation have been taken into in different lenders concerning the use of lead bullets. We also know that at regional level, for example, Parque do Restelovio, the use of lead bullets is prohibited. And of course, we are also aware of the fact that in Canada, California, there is a total ban on the use of lead in hunting. That concerns both shot and in bullets. Our scope of our investigation therefore focuses on the use of gunshots for hunting birds and other animals in non-wetland areas. Gunshots for sports target shooting, including training. Think about, for example, uh, shooting on clay pigeons. Bullets and pellets for hunting any animal, for example deer. Bullets and pellets for sports, target shooting, outdoor only. Fishing tackle for recreational fishing, for example weights, jigs, uh, lures. And commercial fishing gear. We are not assessing indoor shooting. We are also not assessing the use of lead compounds as primers or propellants. Neither are we assessing military, police or other security service use of lead ammunition. In our report, we had found that the use of lead is as follows. Terrestrial shooting, we made a pre preliminary estimate of about 40,000 tons per year. Hunting with bullets, with outdated information, I have to admit, we came to 150 tons. Sport shooting was about 10,000 to 20,000 tons. And fishing uh, resulted in the, the use of two to six thousand tons of lead per year. What are we assessing and on which we like to have further information on in this call for evidence is about the risk assessment, the releases. We would like to have updated information on actual consumption. The human health assessment uh, via the consumption of lead in food. How does that work? Um, what is the mechanism behind this, and to what extent are populations exposed? Analysis of alternatives. Certainly, if we are going to look into the use of lead, we would also like to know what else is being used instead. What is the state of play with that? What are the alternatives? We know about copper bullets, and that that could be an alternative to lead bullets. Shot. We have been widely discussing that already in wetlands. We would like to see if the situation is any different outside of wetlands. And for example, in fishing sinkers, there are alternatives out there that might be used, and we would like to know more about those as well. Um, we're also interested in setting up a good socio-economic analysis. We want to know more about the costs. What would it cost if we would start to regulate lead? What is the cost for the affected industry, for society, for hunters, fishers? If we weigh that against the benefits, so the valuation of environmental benefits, we would like to know what value is being put on nature, on birds, and on how to avoid lead releases. The timeline that we're looking at of us is as follows. It stretches from 2019 into 2020. And we're at the moment in the, pro in the phase where we do the project scoping and planning. We have started the call for evidence last week. It lasts for eight weeks until 16th of December 2019. And we will also do our own review of the literature and we'll do our own discussions with stakeholders. In the first quarter of next year, we would like to organize a stakeholder workshop. It will probably take place in February, which is on invitation only. And we will do further information gathering. 
quarter two of next year, we'll be writing the report. And we hope to finalize that by quarter three next year. So it's ready for submission in October. The call for evidence, like I said, is open until 16th of December 2019. You can find it on our website following the link which is here below. And when you then go to that website, you come to the call for evidence that we discussed today. You'll see from what date and what date it runs. And also what is the scope and what is the objective of the call. Most importantly for you, if you follow the link which says give comments, this is where you'll be taken to the web form on which we would like to receive your comments. We've attached to that call for evidence also a background note in which we explain more about what we would like to have as information and what is the scope of our investigation. This call is practically open to everybody who has an interest, who has a stake in this. It's open to manufacturers, suppliers, distributors and importers, trade associations, hunting, fishing or sports shooting associations, scientific organizations, conservation organizations or other NGOs, also to member states and also first and foremost to individuals, because this is about you, the hunters and the fishers, we would like to know how you are impacted. Information can be submitted confidentiality. Uh, the web form is geared up for that. I think you just have to click uh, a button or a tick, tag uh, a little box, and then we know that your information has been submitted in a confidential manner. We'd like to hand over now to Pete, who's going to give you more about the specific evidence and information that is requested. OK, thank you, Christian. So this final part of the presentation this morning um, will just go into a little bit more detail in terms of um, what we've set out as a specific information and evidence request uh, for this for this res uh, restriction investigation. So all of these uh, questions are uh, detailed in the background note to the, the call for evidence that you can download from the ECHA website at the link that Christian just provided you. Um, I'll go through um, these four questions and the sub-questions uh, briefly here, but it's important, I think, that everyone looks uh, at the background note because some of the questions are elaborated in, in further detail in the note. Okay, so um, Christian outlined the scope and the, the six areas of scope that we're interested in. Um, what we have are essentially four questions and they all relate to each of the items within the scope of the the investigation so for example um, the these four questions relate to the use of lead gunshot in terrestrial areas um, these four questions relate to the use um, of fishing sinkers and and so irrespective of the the particular use of lead um, that you would like to provide input for these four questions um, are relevant um, as well as on the background note, uh, the four, these four questions are detailed on the web form, which is the web form used to submit information. So you can submit information in four different sections on the web form. Um, there's also a section for uh, general comments, um, should you wish to submit information outside of these four questions. And of course, um, we would encourage you to do so if, we've, if there's something that you'd like to tell us that we haven't specifically um, asked for. Okay, so the first question um, really is to do with the risk assessment that we'll do. Um, and um, we're asking for updated information uh, to help us uh, to undertake a robust risk assessment. So essentially what we're asking for is information on the volumes of lead in gunshot bullets, pellets, these air rifle pellets, um, fishing tackle placed on the EU market. And we're interested in total volumes, but also the, the amount of lead contained Per, per unit, so per, per gunshot cartridge, uh, per, per bullet, for example, this will allow us to, to make a, 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 a properly uh, detailed risk assessment. As well as the tonnages, we're interested in the potential for release to the environment during use. Um, and then this will help us in terms of uh, looking at the risk assessment for the environment. Now, ev pretty much everything else on this slide is related to an area uh, that we haven't looked at previously. So we weren't, didn't look at this when we were, uh, or at least we didn't look at it in, in a quantitative extent when we did the wetlands 
proposal, but this is to do with the amount of lead that could be consumed um, when game meat is, is that has been uh, shot with a with lead ammunition um, is then uh, is then consumed. Um, and so we need some more information on this in order to undertake uh, a risk assessment of, of this element of the use of lead. So uh, of course we're interested in uh, statistical information on the amount of game meat that's consumed in humans, um, particularly if there's specific information on certain uh, sensitive uh, subgroups such as infants or, or small children or women of childbearing age for example or, or what could be called high consumers which are people that eat a lot of game meat. These sorts of information is something that the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, looked at when they did their, their recent, well, their relatively recent assessment of the risks posed by uh, lead in, in food. So we're, we're looking for information to, to update the information that EFSA had collated during their assessment. Um, we're information in, uh, interested in information on the absorption of lead that's present in game meat after it's ingested. We're interested in information on, on the blood lead levels um, in game meat consumers and hunters as this blood lead level is what is used to associate the, the, the impacts of the lead. It's, a, it's an indicator. Um, we're also interested in any other relevant human health exposure data related to lead containing gunshot uh, bullets or fishing tackle that we may have uh, missed from these questions. And this final question here is, is not related to the use of lead in ammunition, but it's rather related to the use of lead in fishing tackle. And uh, we are interested in, uh, in an activity which we, we learnt about during the investigation. And we want to know how prevalent it is. And it's this practice of what's termed here home casting of fishing tackle. So basically when people make their own fishing tackle using lead at home um, and then how often this is done, um, how frequently this might be done, and what quantities of lead might be uh, used when people are doing this, um, essentially so that we can look at the exposure related to that home casting um, activity and take that into account in our risk assessment. Um, it, as well as the home casting of fishing sinkers, of course, um, there is this practice of refilling of, of lead cartridges, lead shotgun cartridges that, that takes place um, this wasn't investigated in detail as part of the previous investigation on lead gunshot in, in wetlands, but it was something that we were aware of. And of course, this is now something that we need to come back uh, and revisit in further detail as part of this work. So again, how, how often this home refilling could occur, um, what sort of um, measures are put in place to control exposure to lead um, while this practice is, is ongoing at home, for example. So question two is to do uh, with risk management measures uh, or practices that would minimise exposure to lead uh, for humans or the environment during the use of uh, lead in, in uh, shotgun cartridges, bullets or pellets and in fishing sinkers, fishing tackle. What we're interested in is, for example, um, what best available techniques there are to, to remove lead from the edible portions of meat before it's consumed and what's the effectiveness of this how well do people um, follow this sort of activity, even though this is, this is guidance that's out there and it's been out there for, for a number of years. Um, we are looking at best available techniques to manage lead exposure. And uh, I mentioned here indoor and outdoor shooting grounds here. This was because the background note does mention indoor shooting grounds, but Christian has now clarified that we won't be looking at indoor shooting ranges as part of this restriction proposal. So this question really only relates to outdoor shooting grounds. So what, what measures are already implemented or what could be best practice risk management on these uh, outdoor shooting grounds to manage the exposure to lead? So this would be exposure to the environment through this ingestion and secondary poisoning route, but also um, the potential for exposure to the environment through um, the contamination of groundwater, for example. And finally, the question we have here is, um, we know that uh, certain fishing weights or, or lead within fishing tackle is, is encapsulated and we're interested in, in the effectiveness of this to control the risks um, from the use. Um, in addition to the questions that we have on, on risk, we have uh, questions on the, the socioeconomic elements of the assessment that we will do. 
Um, and this particular question, question three on the background note, is, um, is actually specifically identified as a question on, on alternatives. So we're interested in, as Christian has already mentioned, the identity of existing or emerging alternatives to the use of lead that we're interested in. If the, what's the market share of these comparable products? We're also interested in the technical and the economic feasibility of these potential alternatives, um, specifically looking at product performance, how the performance of these materials may differ to compare to the lead containing products. What other issues uh, could arise from the use of alternatives? So for example, um, existing shotguns or rifles, are they compatible? Um, would they need to be modified? Um, would they need to be uh, exchanged more frequently, for example, because of barrel wear, for example? This is all information that we're very interested in that will be taken into account during the socioeconomic analysis. Um, we're interested in the availability of these alternatives. So, OK, uh, there may be some alternatives available, if, but if they're not available throughout the EU, then this will be important for us to take into account. Um, and uh, we're interested in the hazard and the risk of the use of alternatives. Um, so, for example, um, Christian has mentioned copper. Uh, copper has also been associated with some, some environmental uh, risks in the past. So, of course, moving to an alternative may not mean that uh, all risks are addressed, um, but we're interested in the net reduction in risk that could occur as a result of a, of a restriction. Um, what's particularly interested in uh, on this bullet point here is that we're interested in, in any, any impacts on animal welfare that could arise from, from moving to alternatives. We know that this is an issue that is very much within the forefront of people that are taking part in hunting. Um, they want to ensure that animal welfare is, is maintained, so we don't want to uh, uh, propose something that could have an adverse effect on, on that particular element. Uh, and then finally, any, if there's information on any other particular impacts that are uh, something that you need to share with us, then of course you're very welcome to, to do that. Um, Christian already mentioned these final two bullet points, but these are, these are key issues for us as we look at alternatives within this proposal. Of course, we've already undertaken an analysis of alternatives for the use of lead gunshot in wetlands. So is the situation the same or different for the use of uh, lead gunshot in the terrestrial compartment? Um, or the use of lead gunshot in sports shooting, for example. Uh, and then again, this issue about the non-lead rifle ammunition that's used. Where would substitution be easy? Where would it be prob problematic? Or, or where would it be costly, for example? And this is because we know that there are various different calibers of, uh, of rifles that are used, and it may be more or less difficult to substitute some calibers uh, rather than others. And the final question is, is again, a, a follow-up question on the socioeconomic impacts. And then this is where we want to obtain the information on the costs and benefits to the various affected actors uh, that could be affected by a restriction. So these are manufacturers, the manufacturers of ammunition, the manufacturers of, of shotguns or rifles or air rifles. We're interested in, 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 in professionals that are, that are using these materials and also the general public, as, as Christian had mentioned. Now, the benefits, of course, as well, is uh, the benefits to, to wildlife, for example, if there's less lead poisoning, but also there will be benefits to consumers, for example, if they're not exposed to lead in, the, in their diets. Um, now, when information is provided in terms of impacts on manufacturers, for example, then it's in very important for us, it's useful for us to undertake a good analysis if information, this what we could call key economic information, is provided in, in a comment. It can be provided on a confidential basis, of course. But it's easier for when we undertake a socioeconomic analysis if we know things like uh, the profit loss uh, that would be associated with a move to alternatives, if there would be effects on, on the turnover of, of a business, for example, what the effects would be on employment, for example, and that sort of things, and how market shares of different products could change uh, as a result of a, of a restriction on use. OK, I know there was a lot of detail there, but of course this is all um, covered again in the background note. And if there are questions on these scope uh, type issues and the sort of information that we're asking for here, this is very much what we want to answer questions about today. So please feel free to ask questions about these questions. Thanks. OK, thank you. Peter and Christian. Uh, so now we are coming to the question and answers part of the uh, 
uh, the online information session uh, and uh, we will start um, in a couple of seconds and uh, all the the panelists uh, will will be answering so uh, we I will uh, read out the question and, and then pass it to the uh, the colleague who uh, can answer it best so uh, thanks for the questions that have already come in and uh, please continue sending them during the the, the question and answer session and uh, we will uh, we will get through as many of them as we can as I, I said at the beginning and if not then we will answer them through the Q&A so if you're all ready then uh, let's uh, let's begin so the first question is on the preferred way of submitting scientific material for the call for evidence uh, should this be through uh, email through post through the website or something else so maybe Christian you can take this one and and, and answer it yeah thank you Mark uh, good question the preferred way of receiving information is via the, the link on the web form so that will be via that web form actually that helps us to um, trace who submitted what and also gives in a very consistent manner we can see what has been submitted and, and how it has been submitted so the answer would be via the um, by the web form. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. So the next question is on uh, the request from the Commission. So the Commission asked ECHA to prepare an Annex 15 dossier with a view to a possible restriction uh, on the placing on the market and use of lead in ammunition. So uh, what other options are there besides a restriction uh, that ECHA could, uh, could uh, analyze as part of its investigation. Pete, is this something you could, uh, you could comment on? Yeah, I can comment on that, but Mark, maybe you would complement this as well. Um, so, I mean, ECHA uh, only really has the option to propose a restriction or not to propose a restriction. But of course, uh, before we would come to a conclusion on this, we would undertake what's called uh, an assessment of risk management options as part of the uh, assessment. So, for example, we will look at other legislation which is already uh, in existence uh, within the EU and, and how this would address the risks uh, from the use of lead in, in these, uh, these uses. And it, uh, it could be that some of this legislation could affect uh, these risks or address these risks. Uh, we will look at any voluntary measures which are already in place uh, in relation to these uh, uses of lead in, in these products to see whether or not these voluntary measures will address the risks um, and there could be a, a host of, of other risk management options apart from restriction that could address the risks. Um, if the result of our analysis would be that the risks would be addressed by these other measures, then of course the conclusion would be that there would be uh, no need for, for a restriction on a particular uh, use or one of the sub-uses perhaps that we're already looking at. Okay, thanks, Peter. Maybe just to complement that by saying that we then submit the Annex 15 dossier to the Commission with our risk assessment and, and uh, impact assessment, and then the Commission can uh, take uh, further action if it sees the need under various different types of, 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 of measures. So then the onus will pass to the Commission for the next steps. But uh, thanks for that, Pete. So the next question is, how often does the Commission's final decision follow ECHA's findings and recommendations? Maybe I, I'll take this one uh, uh, just to say that in the majority of cases, the Commission has followed uh, the um, uh, opinions, the advice given in the opinions of the, uh, the committees. Uh, but there have been occasions where the Commission deviates in some way from the uh, advice that's given and this of course is totally up to the Commission they have the latitude to be able to deviate from uh, from the opinions that are sent from them uh, and in these cases they have to make a, uh, a reasoned uh, opinion or a reasoned uh, uh, ev a reasoned way of showing how why they deviated from the opinions but this is totally within their remit but the majority of times they have followed uh, what's in the committee's opinions. So thank you for the question. Uh, concerning how much lead is used in different activities, uh, does the, do the numbers match the production values? So have you tried to 
uh, validate these uh, uh, volumes with the with the manufacturers? Maybe Christian, you you're the best for this one. Yeah, uh, good question indeed. Again, um, what we have done in the, in the in the review study is we looked at what information had been submitted to us in previous uh, work, for example, the the work on the wetlands, where we had the information from the manufacturers that this would indeed be the the amount of lead that would be used. Um, the, the amount of lead shot that would be used. That was concerning wetlands only. Uh, we had also understood that a certain share is still used outside of wetlands, so you know, information comes from that. And um, we've also looked into studies that had been doing uh, similar uh, uh, investigations with industry to see what are the industry figures on consumption and in use. So indeed, most of the information is uh, based on industry information and had been used in other reports and we reused that. Now the question is of course, is that information still valid? Has it been updated? Uh, is it more or is it less? This is exactly where uh, this call for evidence is for, so we would like to see if those figures are reasonably uh, real and whether they can be confirmed again and can be reused in this current investigation. I could perhaps add a little bit on this. Please. So part of this question is, is whether or not the, the information we use will be validated uh, by the manufacturers. Um, I think the call for evidence is an opportunity for the manufacturers to, to give us their most up-to-date information. Um, and also if there is a trade association that could collate information from a variety of manufacturers and then send that to us, then of course that, that might be the, the most uh, effective way of communicating mm. that information on, on tonnages to us and then essentially that's self-validated by the industry because the information will come via industry. Okay, thanks Pete and uh, Christian, good, uh, good answers and uh, I think you're very right in highlighting the public, uh, the call for evidence as the way of submitting such information so that, uh, that we have it uh, available to us during the investigation. Uh, so on slide 21, the next question uh, asks a question on slide 21. Uh, you indicate uh, information you need. Uh, if the person wants to send information, do they have to send it on all topics or can they just send it uh, on, on a few? So who would, who would like to answer that question? I can take that. Okay, thanks. Ben. That's of course, yes, we've, we've set out the, the elements of information that we're interested in, uh, but if you don't have information on all of those elements, it doesn't mean that you can't participate in the call for evidence. Uh, please answer whatever questions you, you can, and then it's completely fine to, to not answer some of the elements that we ask for. And indeed, if you want to submit information that we haven't asked for, again, that's, that's fine as well. Okay, thanks, Pete. The next question is on the scope of the regulation or the investigation, I should say. Uh, so we're just talking about sport shooting and hunting uh, in uh, in in our uh, uh, in the in the information we gave today. Does this mean that uh, lead bullets for self-defense? Uh, I assume also military and and, and other similar uh, types of uses, will they be excluded from the restriction? Mm -hmm. Who would like to answer that one? I'll take this one. I mean, I think what we can talk about is the scope of the investigation now and not the scope of any potential restriction that will come from this. Mm. This is really important to bear in mind. Um, I think what we've been able to clarify up till now is the difference between civilian and non-civilian uses of, of lead in ammunition. Clearly, non-civilian uses are outside of the scope of our investigation. So this would be military uses, police uses, uh, and uses in, in other associated sort of security. Um, what we haven't um, completely resolved is, I would suggest, this issue about use of self-defense. So that would be mm. a civilian use of ammunition. Mm. So they, I would say, for now, are within the scope of our investigation. And uh, if people want to tell us about those uses, um, then they should do so. Um, I would say that the indoor uses, so training on ranges, for example, um, would would be outside of the scope of our investigation, but outdoor uses mm. would be. Thanks, Pete, for clarifying those points. Um, next question uh, is uh, on, um, I think, on uh, the exposure to, to lead. 
Uh, so how does Eka handle the evaluation of a diverse product category where different products within the category have different exposure pathways? So who would uh, like to answer that? Okay, Ida, um, please. Yes, thank you for the question. I guess I could understand this in uh, two ways. Uh, first of all, each uh, identified exposure will be looked into uh, individually and to see if there in fact is risk. Uh, if the risk is not or is it adequately controlled and if it occurs on union-wide basis. Uh, the other way I could understand the, this question is that uh, how we look into the actual exposure pathways, meaning with scope of this restriction that would mean ingestion and inhalation. So I would actually just uh, say the same thing I said first, that we will look into uh, these situations individually. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, the next question is, uh, is quite interesting actually. I think um, uh, it's about uh, old weapons, old historic weapons. Uh, are these in the scope of uh, our investigation? And uh, what information would you need uh, to be able to consider if uh, there was a derogation given for them? So I don't know, maybe Christian or... Mm -hmm. I can answer this. this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, a good question about the old historic weapons. Um, we would understand first and foremost um, what is old, how old. Uh, is it still used for hunting? Is it still used for sports shooting? What do you use it for? And we would like to understand then, if, if you want to ask for a derogation, uh, what is the, yeah, how much, what's the volume of lead that's being used? How much uh, does that cost? What would it cost to, to move to a different alternative? And if that's, we would like to then make an assessment if that cost is actually proportionate to the risk. If it is proportionate, then it could be that this is something that we consider into in, in scope. If it would not be proportionate, if there's really no other way of using these guns than, than with lead only, then this is something that we could uh, consider as a derogation. But for all, in us to make that assessment, we would need to have information about the volumes of lead exposure. Um, if that is taking place, for example, at special events, if there's any way to, to capture that lead. And of course, um, what costs are involved on the basis of all these four elements, we could make. Um, we could consider a derogation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, in uh, the next question uh, is again about the risk assessment. So uh, in terms of ECHA's approach to uh, risk assessment, do the volumes of lead consumption matter uh, from a human health perspective uh, when we have already said there is uh, no safe limit for these substances in, in for certain uh, effects. Uh, so who would like to, to answer that uh, question? I can, I can answer this okay, one. I can get, give a hint at least about how we will be, be approaching this. Um, so I think it's important to bear in mind um, that when we deal with what's considered to be a, a non-threshold substance, um, that there will be uh, a risk associated with any degree of, of, of exposure, so any degree of ingestion when it comes to lead in, in, in game meat, for example. But the amount of risk will depend on the amount of consumption. So there will be a difference in risks between someone that is consuming a small amount of game meat to someone that is uh, potentially uh, eating a large amount of game meat, they would have a higher exposure and therefore they would have a higher risk. So we'll quantify that within the risk assessment. And then of course it's important to remember how within the whole context of our investigation and analysis risk is taken into account. Um, there will be the socio-economic analysis where we'll look at risks and mm. benefits and costs. So um, the benefits of the restriction would be the amount of risk that's been reduced. And that can be quantified, and it can be quantified with exposure to lead in monetary terms, using relationships to lost IQ points and that sort of thing. Then it's possible to compare the, the quantitative benefits of a restriction to the costs to society. In that case, it's, it's, you can compare 
the pros and the cons of taking a regulatory action. And this is essentially the basis of, that we will approach the whole restriction proposal. What are the benefits and what will be the costs? And, and then we will be able to make a conclusion in terms of whether or not a restriction would be proportionate when we've been able to look at the scale of the benefits mm -hmm. versus the scale of the, any costs that will arise. Thanks. OK, thanks, Pete, for that. I hope that answers that, uh, that question. Uh, the next question is on uh, the um, evaluation of alternatives. Uh, so uh, ECHA's guidance, guidance note states that uh, um, part of the uh, elements of uh, uh, the investigation we'll carry out is an analysis of the availability and technical performance of alternatives. So the question is asking, does that uh, evaluation of alternatives also include the uh, potential uh, toxicity of those uh, those alternatives. Now, is that something you can answer, Christian? Yeah, uh, I could answer that. Um, of course, we need to know if, if we're going to stop using that, uh, what else is being used, and what sort of risks that poses to the environment. Uh, we're looking at a, a net reduction of risks to the environment, but in order to, to argue that, that, that net reduction, we need to understand the toxicity of the alternatives. Pete already earlier uh, alluded to, to copper and that has been connected with some uh, environmental concerns in the past. So we need to understand what those concerns are, whether they have been resolved by the use of, of alternative rifle cartridges or alternative shots. So that, that information is part of the, uh, if the, of the evaluation and we will take it into account when uh, moving further with this proposal. Okay, thank you very much for, for that, Christian. Uh, so the next question, again, is on the, the scope. Uh, this is about uh, military use of ammunition. So is this going to be within the scope of the, the restriction? So who would like to, to answer this? I can, I can take this one again, Mark. So I think, but again, this is the scope of the investigation, not the scope of any potential restriction. I think it's clear from uh, the request that was sent to us by the Commission that military uses of ammunition are outside of the scope of our investigation, so we won't be looking at those. Great. Thanks, Pete. So the next question uh, is on uh, the safety of ammunition. Uh, so if there is limited evidence uh, on uh, such an issue as the safety of uh, a particular type of ammunition, uh, I assume this includes ricochets and, and, and the such. Uh, how do you consider uh, this in the investigation, especially if there's only limited evidence uh, about the safe or non-safe use? Is this something one of you would, would like to, to answer? I, I can have a go, but if there's something that, that I miss out, then yeah. yeah. Okay, I, thanks, Pete. Yeah. I think um, there may always be uncertainties in the available information and we take into account these uncertainties when, when, when we make uh, the analysis and uncertainties are, a, are, a, are a, a, a specific part of the reporting that we do. So we would, would make it clear where information is, is, is uncertain or where information is more definitive. Um, I think on a particular issue in terms of the safety of, of ammunition, we will certainly look at, at what, what is available um, and then we will very much be relying as well on information uh, from our stakeholders and, and in order to communicate to us um, in the call for evidence what the level of information would be in terms of the safety of alternatives. Um, and it's perhaps in the most uh, useful information could come from member states that have already transitioned to the use of lead-free ammunition, for example, where uh, possibly safety information uh, would be m most relevant because they have most experience of using some of these alternatives. So we'd be very interested in, in that sort of information from member states or, or other regions where alternatives are already widely in place. OK, thanks very much for that, uh, Pete. Uh, the next question is on, on uncertainties in, in our assessment. So uh, the question says that there are many difficult questions to answer in this investigation. Uh, for example, about uh, game consumption patterns, meat handling and preparations, tonnage of lead used in different uh, activities. 
uh, and uh, there will be no time, of course, to undertake new research in these areas uh, before to be able to feed into the uh, the call for evidence and probably not the investigation. So, how would we deal with that? Will we? The question asks: Will we use some sort of confidence assessment for the data? So who would like to answer this question? I can answer that. I think this is no different from any other restriction proposal that we, we look at. Um, we will always consider the reliability of, of the data that we're looking at, uh, any uncertainties. Uh, but there are different ways that we can take this into account. When we're doing an analysis, we can use different scenarios, for example, uh, based on ranges of data um, or where we're not sure whether or not uh, it would be a particular uh, number that's more relevant versus another uh, number that would be more relevant we, we can look at different scenarios and ranges and then present conclusions not as a definitive uh, value for example but as again as as, uh, as limits between maybe a lower bound assumption uh, and an upper bound assumption in terms of costs and benefits and that sort of thing where we have where we have uncertainties i think it's probably uh, safe to say that um, where there is uncertainty in data, that wouldn't prevent us from undertaking an analysis, but it would certainly influence in terms of how we communicated the, the confidence that we had in a certain outcome. And this is where you might see results expressed as a range of possible uh, outcomes rather than a definitive uh, analysis. If I may add yes. something, uh, I think we also welcome any existing uh, data you, you see relevant. And uh, if you have any knowledge on, on ongoing research that may give us some, some relevant res uh, results during this uh, restriction proposal uh, assessment, uh, this is, of course, something also we would be interested in. Okay. Thanks very much, both of you. Uh, so the next question is uh, on uh, specific types of firearms uh, that may not have been specifically mentioned in the uh, uh, investigation report that we did previously or, or in the uh, information that we have set out uh, for this call for evidence. Uh, it particularly mentions pistols and revolvers for target shooting on outdoor ranges. Uh, and the question is, is the ammunition for such firearms within the scope of this investigation? Is that something perhaps, Christian, you could you could answer? Yes, thank you, Moses. I can answer that. Um, we're interested in any use of lead in ammunition. Um, if yeah, I would certainly submit any information that you would have on this particular top topic. As I said, we were interested in all uses of lead ammunition. Um, during the investigation, we can make further categorizations into issue into situations where um, switching to alternatives will be difficult or problematic. So, I would say it is in scope for now. And I would certainly submit any information that you would have on these particular types of, uh, of guns. Okay, thanks very much, Christian. Uh, the next question is uh, on a uh, previous uh, ECHA report. I'm not quite clear if this is the lead in wetlands uh, report or if it's the investigation report we carried out and, and published uh, last year. Uh, but uh, it's um, uh, talking about the types of arguments that we were using, uh, collecting from studies uh, that were uh, seeming to be from, from one side. Uh, but uh, I think uh, maybe you can explain a bit of the approach now that we are taking for uh, the current investigation and, and uh, how we deal with perhaps uh, pro-ban pro and, and anti-ban uh, uh, information that comes in. Who would like to take that? Um, yeah, I can take it, but I think maybe my colleagues would also want yeah. to compliment yeah. anything that I say on this particular one. I think uh, this issue is, I mean, we're very, very aware of this issue. We know that this restriction is, is very emotive for, for many people. I think what we can say is that ECHA is a scientific organisation. We undertake scientific evaluation of, of available data and information. Um, we, we take a very dispassionate view to this particular issue and um, we, we are looking at the facts when it comes to the analysis and any, any conclusions from that. Um, if you uh, feel that maybe some, some arguments have not been taken forward uh, in previous assessments and you think that they would be relevant for, for this particular uh, analysis, then please use the call for evidence to 
draw our attention to these, um, but with the caveat that they need to be supported with scientific justification, argumentation, and, and evidence f to be able to, for us to be able to weight the significance and importance of, of a particular information source compared to, to others. Yeah, and I can complement that maybe. Um, as I said, as Pete said, we, we, with this passion, we take an objective point of view. We take an objective point of view towards any information that would support it. But also, in, in fact, an uh, objective point of view to anything that would not support it. So we're, we're neutral towards this. We are mainly looking at uh, evidence and scientific facts. And we will do our own independent assessment of those. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for, for those answers. Uh, the next question is about training and sports shooting. Uh, I think I will a little bit just ask uh, uh, a question around this to so that we can perhaps um, deal with deal with this issue. Uh, are these in the scope of the restriction, and why are they in the scope of the of the investigation? I should say. Who would like to take that? Um. I can do that. Uh, training and sports shooting, like I said, we, we are looking into um, the scope of this current investigation contains outdoor uh, sports shooting. It's not concerned indoor sports shooting. If training and sports shooting takes place outdoor, then indeed this is part of our um, evaluation. And yeah, that's where I would like to leave it. Mm -hmm. And I think just to complement that is it's important that we know that outdoor uh, sports shooting and, and training will, will most often happen on training uh, sh shooting grounds. So this is what's prompted our question on the risk management activities and, and management of these outdoor shooting grounds and, and how they are controlling the risks that could arise from the use of lead ammunition on, on, on these sites. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've had a, a couple of questions uh, relating to uh, some specific studies, and I, I think it's uh, difficult for us to to answer those directly today. I think the message that we we give there is that people should submit, as I think as uh, Ida said, that uh, they should submit any studies uh, that they have uh, into the call for evidence, uh, and then this evidence can be uh, evaluated as as part of our our investigation. So I hope this answers perhaps several questions on specific studies that uh, have been raised that I that I won't take now uh, because we it's difficult to 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 remember every study that we've we've looked at. Uh, next question is on uh, alternatives to uh, the uh, lead ammunition. So uh, all the uh, um, ammunition. Alternatives, copper, zinc, tin, steel, wolfram are harder than lead. So there will be much more projectile reflections resulting in deadly injuries. Uh, this is a physical law principle. So this is about ricochet. Uh, I think something that we, we, we looked into mm -hmm. quite deeply in the, the lead in uh, shot in wetlands um, investigation. Uh, so uh, how will we take this into uh, account in the uh, uh, this investigation, Christian. Again, yeah, uh, thank you. you can take this. I can take this. Um, a good question indeed. Uh, we are very much aware that um, we, we've done our assessment for the wetlands. Uh, we we need to understand better what issues may arise in, uh, outside of wetlands. It may be that ricochet is much more important there than in than in the actual wetlands itself. So again, I, I would warmly welcome any information that you might have on this, under which circumstances does ricochet uh, occur, what are the consequences, uh, how much harm does it cause, uh, how much harm does it cause to wildlife, humans, actual hunters. And so if there's any information that you may have on this and that you can, for example, back up with statistics or scientific evidence, then we would welcome that in the course of this investigation and this call for evidence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can complement that a little bit. Just to give a bit more example of how this issue was was looked at in the wetlands proposal, uh, and there was uh, a very high quality scientific study that came out of Germany mm -hmm. that very much underpinned the, our conclusions in terms of ricochet from steel shot. Um, and uh, I won't summarise the, the findings of, of that of that study because they're detailed obviously in the report, and I don't want to to miss out on important detail. But 
it was it was a scientific assessment. It looked at the probability of ricochet, looked at the energy of the ricochet, which is important as well. And on that basis, it was considered that there were no additional risks from from ricochet from steel gunshot, um, at least within the wetlands context. Um, we do know that the terrestrial context is perhaps slightly different with lower shooting angles and that sort of thing as well. But again, just to emphasise what Christian said, it's we're, we'll evaluate the, the scientific data surrounding any claims around uh, ricochet mm -hmm. um, rather than uh, than perhaps just uh, just uh, uh, perhaps some concerns around ricochet because concerns have been raised around ricochet many times in the past and they haven't really uh, been borne out when it's come to the to a scientific evaluation of the of the consequences of that ricochet again just to come back to this instances where we know uh, where alternatives are being used um, there would be obviously greater experience of the practicalities of ricochet within those uh, member states and those countries so information on the the prevalence and the impact of ricochet where alternatives are actually in place and being used a lot um, will be of, of high relevance for us as we as we look at this issue particularly yeah. okay thanks very much for that um, next question uh, um, on uh, in the investigation uh, how will we assess uh, whether um, hunters and perhaps other people exposed to, to lead through hunting uh, will suffer harm from, from its use. Uh, maybe uh, who, who would like to take this? I can uh, take definitely. that. Okay. Um, maybe afterwards, either you can complement as well in terms of human health. So like uh, Pete already uh, alluded before to the, the risk of ricochet, um, we would very much like to know, of course, we're looking at the, the the risk to the environment of any alternatives, but we're also interested in any other risk that may arise from the using those alternatives. Uh, the one that we can think of right now is first and foremost ricochet, and that answer has just been given uh, very elaborately by, by Pete, and I think that uh, the same considerations uh, would apply to this, this question. Maybe Ida, you want to complement this? Um, well, I guess this is quite central to our work, and um, Maybe we could refer to the investigation report where the studies uh, and uh, these already identified possible uh, risks and yeah. harms have been discussed. And that's the basis for our work at the moment. And all the information you can provide to us on these issues, uh, we will use to assess it further. Great. Thanks. So the next question is uh, also very interesting. So if uh, our investigation concludes that there needs to be a restriction, uh, is it planned to combine that with the, uh, the wetland uh, uh, restriction uh, proposal um, and uh, to deal with it all in one uh, entry? I mean, maybe I can, I can take that. I mean, at the end of the day, the decision uh, on what to do with uh, the um, led in wetlands and this uh, restriction if we propose it is will be up to the Commission. The Commission may decide uh, to combine them, it may decide to have them separate. This is something that will be decided uh, after the uh, investigation is complete and then if we propose a restriction once the opinions are sent to, to the Commission. Okay, the next question is uh, a little bit on uh, taking into account uh, other um, uh, jurisdictions where uh, these um, uh, restrictions on on lead have been have been considered. This one particularly uh, looks at uh, uh, Norway and uh, how we take some of these um, uh, other decisions into account in our investigation. Who would like to to answer that one? I can answer that. So yes, indeed, we are, we are looking into the, the experience that may uh, be already out there uh, with the use of, of lead and um, restricting the use of lead. Uh, we know that there's a huge amount of experience in the Netherlands and in Denmark. Uh, you may have already seen it in the wetlands dossier. We took that into account. We take into account all experience that may be out there in other jurisdictions with these uh, 
with regulating this issue further. So that indeed would also apply to the Norwegian situation. Um, if there's more information than that you could give about reasons why and under what circumstances this ban has actually lifted, uh, then we would very much like to receive that. And uh, yeah, I would like to leave it with that. Okay. Thanks very much, Christian. Uh, next question is a little bit about the scope again, uh, about uh, military uses being excluded, but what about other uh, uses, police, customs, other internal security applications? Uh, maybe we can, uh, we can make a very clear uh, uh, answer to, to this one, because I think it's very important to mm -hmm. understand uh, the scope uh, regarding these issues. Absolutely. So, I mean, it, there is a slide on this uh, in the presentation, and we'll also make sure that this is super clear uh, in the Q&A. But in terms of our scope, um, all non-civilian uses, so this would be military uses, police uses, other security um, forces operating within uh, member states, and then this would extend also to customs, are outside of the scope. Uh, of, of what we're looking at. The, the, the question that we had earlier about civilian uses, so self-defense uses, for example, is something that we we haven't completely clarified yet, but so uh, I would suggest that civilian uses are inside the scope of our investigation for now, um, and all non-civilian uses are outside of the scope yeah. of our investigation. Okay, thanks, Pete. Uh, just to say that we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left available. Uh, if uh, anyone would like to uh, ask a, uh, a last question, then please uh, make use of, uh, of this time. Uh, and uh, we will need to wrap up about uh, in about 15 minutes, but uh, we will try and answer questions up until uh, the end of the uh, online information session. Uh, so uh, the next uh, question is uh, uh, a little bit uh, of a new area. So uh, do uh, we need information on uh, water and uh, water quality and drinking water perhaps, which is affected by uh, lead ammunition or, or, or uh, fishing weights? And, and what type of information could be, uh, could be uh, useful? Who would like to take that? Um, I think what would be particularly interesting actually in terms of uh, water quality um, and, and again even drinking water quality is, is in relation to shooting, shooting grounds yeah. and, and shooting ranges where uh, there's a very high intensity use potentially of, of lead containing ammunition and we are aware of um, some studies that have linked um, uh, shooting ranges to elevated concentrations of lead in groundwater and potentially uh, elevated levels of, of lead in, in surface water that's running off from these shooting ranges. So uh, any studies uh, where that's shown to be the case or, or equally where it's not been the case because of the risk management measures that are used on shooting grounds or ranges, and then we'd be interested in information uh, on that uh, via the call for evidence. Um, I would suggest by uh, question number two or, or question number one. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Pete. Very clear. Uh, oh, another very interesting question come up now that uh, I think this again will come to you, Pete, but uh, uh, how will we look at the uh, approach to risk to birds? Mm -hmm. um, what if there are no impacts on populations of, of birds? Uh, how will we approach risk in this respect? Maybe you can also mention uh, how RAC looked at this in the uh, previous uh, yeah, restriction proposal. I mean, I think that's probably the, the, the most uh, relevant um, line of thinking in, in terms of this risk to, to populations of birds. Um, this was very much taken into consideration by us as the dossier submitter for the wetlands proposal, but also uh, evaluated in detail by, by the RAC. Uh, the Risk Assessment Committee when they evaluated the proposal uh, and, and very much uh, when they were looking at risks to birds, uh, they were looking at the level of individual mortality that was occurring as a result of the use of lead. And so again, with this estimate of, 
of around a million uh, birds per year in the EU uh, that were uh, felt to be uh, uh, dying as, re as a result of direct uh, lead ingestion. Um, they complemented this against uh, some of the available information that are looked at population modelling, um, where perhaps the impacts on population level um, were not so severe. Uh, and they came to that conclusion that um, the effects on the individuals were sufficiently uh, widespread and of sufficient magnitude that they were important in themselves uh, for taking uh, risk management measures, um, irrespective of uh, any available information on, on population level effects that had been uh, presented. And I think just to emphasize that some of the population level data out there was looking at endpoints such as risk of extinction, for example, uh, and and the RAC certainly uh, felt that this endpoint was not consistent with the objectives of, of REACH to to uh, to have a, a safe level of of, uh, of lead in the environment. Um, an extinction level risk is, is is many stages beyond which which would be uh, acceptable for risk assessment. Thanks, Pete. Uh, we have uh, about five to ten minutes left, so uh, we have um, another question here to answer before that. Uh, in terms, again, of we've been asked about the uh, uh, experience from, from Norway and uh, whether we have used uh, any reports from Norway in the study. Excuse me. Uh, I think I will, will answer that to say that uh, we have gathered all of the scientific information uh, that's available uh, that has been taken into account in different uh, member states. So not only Norway, but also uh, Denmark, for example, that has a, uh, a full ban on, uh, on the, 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 the lead in, in shot and the Netherlands and Belgium, for example. So we look at all of the scientific information uh, that's available and uh, make a, an investigation based on that. If the information is more political or policy orientated, then this is something that we, we don't take into account in our in investigation. We are purely looking at the scientific information. Does anyone like to compliment that or? Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, another question on uh, uh, the uh, ingestion of lead uh, from uh, game material. So uh, how will we uh, investigate the lead retention of uh, 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 or the lead retention in people who are eating uh, game meat uh, in the time of this short time of this investigation? So who would like to answer that? Well, I can say we have 12 months to do our investigation and, and prepare the report, which is a which is a relatively short time if we were conducting uh, our own studies in terms of uh, the retention of, of lead in game meat and, and, uh, and how, uh, how this is being consumed. But I, I would probably say that there is already quite a large scientific literature available um, that we will use uh, as the basis for our analysis. Um, so we will, we will certainly focus on, on existing studies um, where they're high quality um, and any, any new information that comes in the call for evidence can be taken into account. I should probably I could mention maybe that EFSA again the European Food Safety Authority has databases on the, on the occurrence of different contaminants in food and also um, on the uh, the consumer behavior in terms of how typically different meals are eaten and of course we we're in touch with the EFSA and uh, we'll be using their available information and databases as far as possible when it when it comes to uh, making our investigation Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Pete. Uh, okay, so um, another uh, uh, question, a little bit that you touched on during the um, the presentation, but I think it's good to uh, good to uh, emphasise this. So, uh, what information uh, do we need on home casting? Mm -hmm. Who would like to to answer that one? I can answer that. Uh, home casting, yeah. So. We know that the lead in, in workplaces is very much regulated. There are occupational uh, limits of how much lead there can be in air. 
there's pretty good biomonitoring about how much uh, lead can be found in blood lead levels as a result of exposure to lead in workplaces. So I, th I think one of the things that we would like to understand is, is how is home casting done? Is the same, are the same issues that lead causes at workplaces, are those applicable to the home casting situations? Um, so we would like to understand how it's done, uh, under what sort of circumstances, and indeed uh, whether or not such same issues are applicable to, to home uh, as in workplaces as to home casting. So that's the sort of information we're looking at, and that is the sort of information that we'll also take further in our uh, investigation. So if you have information on that, then we would very much like to receive that. Thanks a lot, Christian. Uh, then this is, uh, I think, the last question. Uh, asking about how will we uh, get an idea of the volumes of lead used uh, in indoor shooting and outdoor shooting. Uh, we will probably just get a, uh, um, a kind of a combined yeah. uh, uh, volume from the manufacturers, but how then will we look to split this in terms of uh, uh, the outdoor shooting that where we're really interested? Mm. I can maybe uh, reflect on this one a little bit. I mean, I'd hope um, that uh, where information is available in, in industry and in trade associations and they understand the scope of our investigation and um, that they may well be able to take this into account when they're submitting information to us and it would be most useful for us if if the tonnages were uh, differentiated between uses that are inside the scope of our investigation and uses that are outside of the scope of our investigation and and where these splits are done it would be important for us um, to be able to, to know how that splits, w splits w were done. So if there were assumptions made um, by respondents to the call for evidence about how they made the split, they should tell us how they've, how they've done the split and why they've done the mm. split. I think typically the manufacturers will be in a, in a better position than us in order to make the correct assumptions about what splits and how the market is behaving. We're, 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 we're very reliant on, on the quality of the information that will come from industry uh, to, to make these different mm. assumptions. And maybe also sports shooting uh, organisations, I mean, they all mm -hmm. might also might have uh, uh, some good information on, on how much is uh, done inside and, and, and outside. Maybe yeah. that can also yeah. be submitted in the public consultation mm -hmm. if it's available. Absolutely. I mean, there could be certain types of ammunition that are only used indoors and certain types that are only used outdoors, for example, yes. and then where that's clear, and there's a good rationale for that, then it will be very useful and, mm. and interesting for us to, 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 to know. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, that brings us to the end of the questions. And uh, actually, we're approaching the, the time we need to, uh, to finish. So maybe uh, just to say, first of all, thank you very much for the questions that were sent in. They were uh, very, uh, very interesting and very uh, useful and uh, uh, gave us some actually some additional uh, ideas where we, we might need to focus some attention and we hope also it's been useful for for you to get an idea of perhaps how we will approach certain issues and to uh, inform you a bit more about what information uh, we will we will need to have submitted in the call for evidence uh, to uh, help our investigation. So thanks very much for, for your uh, attention here and thanks for, uh, uh, for the questions. Now it just leads me to wrap up uh, by saying that uh, we will uh, answer the questions uh, in, uh, in a question and answer document that we will make uh, available online as soon as possible. This means that uh, you can go back and, and check the answers or if people uh, you can point people towards the questions and answers uh, if you find that uh, uh, people are asking you the same question in your organisations. We will make the uh, recording of this online information session available uh, again as soon as possible. And uh, we would just like to remind you that the call for evidence finishes uh, just before Christmas, so the 16th of December. All uh, information be should be submitted by the web form for the reasons that Christian had previously uh, explained. Uh, and uh, we welcome uh, all uh, information that, that comes to us and we will look at it very, uh, we will assess it uh, dispassionately and uh, uh, take the scientific uh, information into account in our investigation. 
The next stage after that is to hold a workshop. Uh, we think this will be round about uh, February. And this will be very similar to the workshop that we held for the lead in shot in wetlands, which will bring together active participants to uh, this uh, online information session. Uh, and uh, we will uh, make uh, invitations uh, based on the uh, call for evidence call for evidence responses that we receive. So uh, if you make a very detailed, very uh, informative uh, response, then uh, we will, uh, of course, consider you for this workshop. So now it just uh, uh, falls on me to thank my colleagues uh, on the, the panel, Peter, Christian, and Ida, and all other colleagues who are uh, in, been involved in this uh, online information session. And uh, I'd like to wish you a very good day. And uh, thanks very much for the questions and your attention. Goodbye.